Walter, where are you? My water just broke. Come home right away. What? That's impossible. I'm on a trip with Miranda right now. So, I'm not nearby. Maybe you should call your parents? What? No way. I told him today was my due date. Yet, my husband Walter was traveling with his mistress, Miranda. Even though I was angry, I called my father, Justin, in a hurry. With the help of my father and his subordinate, Daniel, I managed to give birth to a baby girl safely. Despite the fact that he had planned a trip with Miranda on the due date, Walter didn't visit me in the hospital. Even after finding out our daughter was born, he continued his trip. Does Walter really think Miranda is more important than our newborn daughter? Furious, I decided to get revenge. I asked my father, who owns a construction company, to help with my plan, and Walter was in for a surprise when he returned from his trip. My name is Kelly. I'm a 37-year-old housewife who got married a year ago. Before marriage, I worked at my father's construction company. I had been single and devoted to work until my mid-30s, planning to eventually take over the company. But then, a turning point came. It was when we were hired to renovate a hospital in a neighboring town. On my way home from work, a man suddenly spoke to me. Excuse me, are you on your way home? If you don't mind, would you like to have dinner together? The man who approached me was a doctor working at the hospital. I had no particular plans, so I couldn't find a reason to refuse and decided to go with him. The doctor, three years older than me, was named Walter. He said he had been watching me at work and thought I was a hardworking and reliable type, which piqued his interest. Walter, like me, was single and focused on his career. Having had little luck with men until now, I wondered if this was a date invitation and felt hopeful. It was about time I met someone good. But I also had the goal of taking over the company. Since Walter was a doctor, I wondered if he was a good match for someone like me, the future heir of a construction company. I was curious about Walter's views on marriage, so I asked. Do you expect the woman you marry to have a job? Walter smiled as he answered my nervous question. No. It may sound old-fashioned, but since my job often keeps me away from home, I'd prefer my partner to take care of the household. But I'll provide well and she never feels neglected. While he clearly expressed his views, it wasn't the answer I had hoped for. Maybe I didn't ask the right question. It seemed like he thought I wanted to be a housewife if we got married. I wondered if our values were compatible if we married. Feeling uncertain about our future together, I decided to give up on dating him. In the end, we exchanged contact information and went home without any conclusions. However, that night, I couldn't stop thinking about him. I realized I really liked him. As I pondered this, he called me. Sorry, I couldn't stop thinking about you after getting home. Would you like to date me? What? I was thinking the same thing. I never imagined Walter felt the same way. And so, I started dating Walter. But there was still the issue of taking over the company. When I consulted my father, he said, Don't worry about the company. We have many capable employees. Focus on your happiness. My heart was full of gratitude. Then, Walter proposed, and we got married. A happy married life was supposed to start. But as Walter had mentioned, he was away for work more often than I expected. After quitting my job to become a housewife, I decided to manage the household well, but I started feeling lonely being home alone. Even when Walter was home, he was too tired for me to complain about being lonely. But my problems didn't end there. Walter's salary was deposited into our joint bank account. But on payday, Walter would withdraw about half immediately. 
When I asked what he was spending it on, Walter, looking annoyed, said. The medical field requires spending on conferences and training. And teamwork is crucial, so I can't refuse colleagues' invitations. Just because I earn a high salary doesn't mean I can spend it all. Though I had never worked in the medical field, his explanation seemed convincing, but I still didn't fully understand. Maybe it's the wife's role to manage the remaining money well. Thinking probing further would upset him, I didn't ask more. But maybe that was a mistake. Once you show leniency, things escalate. The next month, Walter withdrew even more money. What was once half became a third, then a quarter. With the remaining money so low, no matter how frugally I lived, it wasn't enough. Every time Walter came home, I asked why he was spending so much, and he always said it was necessary expenses. But isn't this just too much? I've reached my limit too. No way, even if it's necessary, I can't manage with so little money for living expenses. It can't be helped. If it's that bad, why don't you get a job yourself? Now he says this? It was him who asked me to quit my job in the first place. Feeling furious, I started feeling nauseous and sick to my stomach. Ugh. Reaching my breaking point, I rushed to the bathroom. After vomiting, I felt a little better, but his voice behind me still tightened my chest. Now you're faking illness to get sympathy? Sorry, but I'm not falling for that. No, it's not that, just leave me alone. I left and went to a room I usually don't use. I couldn't stand to sleep in the same room as Walter tonight. So, I decided to sleep here for the night. However, lying down, the nausea wouldn't go away. It felt like something was stuck in my throat too. I couldn't sleep all night. Maybe it was some internal disease. The next morning, still feeling sick, I ignored Walter as he left for work and headed to the hospital. Instead of going to Walter's workplace, I chose a hospital closer to home. After explaining my symptoms, I was surprisingly referred to the obstetrics department. Thinking it might be possible, I headed to the obstetrics department in the same hospital. After the examination, I was diagnosed as eight weeks pregnant. The doctor congratulated me, but I honestly didn't know how to feel. I decided to tell Walter. Surely, if he knew we were having a baby, he would reconsider his spending. I sent a message about the pregnancy on my smartphone. There was no response for a while. Could he not be happy about the baby? Feeling uneasy, I waited for Walter to come home that night. But Walter didn't come home easily. He had no plans tonight. It was past 1 a.m. when Walter finally returned home and, as soon as he saw my face, he asked something unexpected. You're still up, but that's fine. You're not planning on having the baby, right? What? Why would you ask that? Is there a reason I shouldn't? Walter's unexpected reaction shocked me. If he didn't want a child, why did he get married? When I asked for an explanation, he started telling an unbelievable story. Apparently, a woman he grew up with recently divorced. Since she married against her parents' wishes, she couldn't go back home and was struggling alone. So Walter was helping her as much as he could. I was stunned by this story. Why does Walter need to help her? It's her problem. It's not that simple. Miranda, the woman, used to help me when I was bullied as a kid. So now, I want to help her. Is it a repayment for childhood kindness? I can understand the sentiment, but shouldn't he prioritize his own child now? Then I realized. Wait, the money you've been withdrawing, was that going to Miranda? Not all of it. Some went to Miranda, but it was for a good cause. Walter's excuses infuriated me. Even if he meant well, it was important to consult me first. Maybe due to the morning sickness, 
I said something I shouldn't have. If she is that important to you, then leave. We're getting a divorce. Fine, divorce it is. I can't stand someone who doesn't understand me. I wish I had married Miranda in the first place. Walter stormed out. Last night, I was so angry that I might have gone too far. For the sake of our baby, having a father would be better. I tried calling to apologize, but he didn't answer. I sent a message apologizing. But there was no response. Should I give up on having this baby? That evening, I visited my father's company and told him everything. My father was furious. Walter is out of his mind. Even if it's a childhood friend, how could he use our living expenses to help her? You're right. I should have managed things better. Should I give up on having this baby? My father, seeing me caress my belly, disagreed. No, that child is a precious life. Don't worry about anything else, just have a healthy baby. I'll handle everything else. My father's words brought tears to my eyes. Everyone at the company who heard said they would help too. They were all my colleagues who worked with me and shared everything. Encouraged by my strong support system, I decided to have the baby. When I returned home, Walter was waiting at the door. He looked awkward and seemed to be waiting for me. Why are you here, Walter? Weren't you leaving? I was going to leave, but Justin called and yelled at me. He said if I didn't come back, I'd have to pay $100,000 in alimony and child support. I was scared, so I came back. Using your father to threaten me isn't fair. I see, that's how it was. Well, in any case, he's back, so I told Walter about my decision to have the baby and my due date. However, even after thinking he had changed, Walter was still frequently away from home. And he still withdrew money without permission. You're giving it to Miranda again, aren't you? Even with such sarcasm, he just ignored me. Walter only came back because he didn't want to pay a large sum of money. And so, as Walter rarely returned home, I was approaching my due date. It would be too much of a burden on my father to give birth at my father's house, so I decided to wait for Walter at home. But even on the due date, he didn't come back. Alone at home, I grew increasingly anxious. Then it happened. Suddenly, labor pains began. And then, a warm flow, my water broke. Unable to bear it, I tried to call a taxi, but I couldn't find the piece of paper with the taxi company's phone number. I should have saved it on my smartphone. Calling an ambulance would bother the neighbors. I should call Walter right away. When I called, Walter answered immediately. Walter, where are you? My water broke. Come home right away. What? That's impossible. I'm on a trip with Miranda right now. So, I'm not nearby. Maybe you should call your parents? What? No way. I had told him today was my due date. Yet, why was he on a trip with Miranda? But there was no time to be angry in this urgent situation. I hung up in a hurry and called my father. He said he would come immediately. Since my father doesn't have a driver's license, he came with his subordinate driving. Kelly! Are you okay? To the hospital! Let's go to the hospital right away! My father shouted as he ran towards me, and next to him was Daniel, his subordinate who was driving. Daniel, the company's executive, was always a strong support for my father in emergencies. With my arms over my father's and Daniel's shoulders, they carried me to the car seat. My father sat next to me, rubbing my back and encouraging me until we reached the hospital. Thanks to them, I safely gave birth to a baby girl. They said it would have been dangerous if we had arrived any later. I was filled with gratitude for my father and Daniel. 
a precious life granted thanks to them. I couldn't help but love my red-faced, crying daughter. My father was also overjoyed to have a grandchild. I asked my father to bring Daniel into the delivery room. I wanted to thank the person who helped save my daughter's life as soon as possible. Daniel entered the room, looking a bit embarrassed. Kelly. Congratulations on your birth. No, it's thanks to you. Thank you. He laughed and lightly denied it. No, I didn't do anything. For a moment, I felt a warm atmosphere and smiled. Was it my imagination, or did my daughter, who had stopped crying at some point, seem to smile too? Seeing my daughter's peaceful face, I vowed to make her happy no matter what. However, being in the hospital room still made me feel down. Because I couldn't get in touch with Walter since that incident. He knew I was hospitalized and I had told him the room number in a smartphone message. Thinking about Walter, who didn't respond no matter how much I waited, made me more and more depressed. Even after knowing our daughter was born, he still seemed to be continuing his trip. Does Walter really value Miranda more than our newborn daughter? I knew getting upset wasn't good for my daughter. Still, I couldn't control my feelings. I remembered his words the last time we talked on the phone. What do you mean, traveling with Miranda? Those words kept running through my mind. I couldn't suppress my anger because I loved Walter. Finally, in my rage, I planned my revenge on Walter. While carefully plotting in my mind, I was startled by a voice from behind. What's wrong, Kelly? You have a scary look on your face. When I came to my senses, my father was there. Dad, how long have you been there? I just came in. I wanted to call out, but you were looking down with a scary face. Is it about Walter? I nodded quietly in response to my father's question. Was my face really that scary? I glanced in the mirror and tried to force a smile. That's right, since my father was here, I thought I would ask him for something. It was about the revenge I had just thought of against Walter. Dad, I have a favor to ask. I want everyone at the company to help too. I started explaining the plan in detail to my father, who listened intently with his arms crossed. When I finished speaking, my father tilted his head in concern. Isn't that a bit too much? You haven't even had a proper conversation since the baby was born. Well, it's a slow time at work, so I don't mind. It's fine. Talking to Walter is pointless. Besides, if I don't teach him a lesson, he won't learn. Please, Dad. I pleaded desperately. Moved by my determination, my father finally agreed. I could already imagine Walter's shocked face. A few days had passed since the birth. Despite being an older mother, my recovery was smooth and I was able to leave the hospital safely. After being discharged, I decided to stay at my father's house with my daughter. The plan I had asked my father to carry out was swiftly executed by everyone at the company while I was in the hospital. On the way home from the hospital, we stopped by the site and attached something to the no-entry rope. That something was. When I called Walter's workplace, I found out he had taken a two-week leave. He had applied for the leave, stating that his wife was due to give birth, but he had probably been enjoying a vacation the whole time. Judging by the dates of his leave request, he should be coming home today. As expected, Walter called in the evening. As soon as I answered, he started yelling. Hey! Why is our house a vacant lot? What happened to the house and my stuff? And where are you? You don't have to ask all at once. I'll answer properly. I couldn't help but chuckle at his panic. Our house was in my father's name, and our company built it. So, I had asked them to demolish it while Walter was away. Walter's belongings were sent to his parents' house. 
When I explained the situation to his parents, they were furious with Walter. They even said they wanted to come apologize immediately, but I told them it was an issue between us until we had a proper conversation. Walter was still confused on the phone. Since he didn't seem to notice, I asked him, Did you see the letter I left on the rope at the vacant lot? It was covered in plastic to keep it dry. It seemed Walter hadn't noticed, as I heard him searching hurriedly. Is this it? After hearing the sound of plastic and paper tearing, I heard Walter's angry voice again. Why is there a divorce application in here? And why is your section already filled out? What did I do? Oh? You were on a vacation with your childhood friend while your wife was giving birth. That's a valid reason for divorce, don't you think? An affair? Where's the proof? I just went on a trip with her because she wanted to go. I didn't do anything wrong. Don't accuse me without evidence. Walter denied the affair, but I had solid evidence. After giving birth, I told my father about Walter and Miranda's trip, and Daniel overheard. When he heard the name Miranda, Daniel reacted. Isn't that Miranda Brown? That's my ex-wife who recently divorced. I knew Daniel had married about a year ago, but had never met his wife and heard they recently divorced. When I described Miranda's features that Walter had told me, Daniel confirmed it. Daniel then said, I know where she wanted to go. I'll send my subordinates to investigate. Following Daniel's instructions, several young subordinates from the company went to the hotel where Walter and Miranda were staying. They stayed in the room next door, recording Walter and Miranda walking closely together and their voices of affection. When I told Walter that these would serve as evidence, he hung up without saying anything. I figured where he would go. After a while, Daniel and I headed to the place Walter likely went. It was the apartment where Daniel had lived with Miranda before their divorce. Daniel had kicked her out because of her affair. So Daniel told Miranda to leave, but since she showed no sign of leaving, Daniel moved out. When we arrived, Walter was there. Walter's car was in the parking lot. Daniel immediately headed to Miranda's apartment, and I followed. When we rang the doorbell, Miranda answered. Looking surprised to see Daniel. Daniel? Why are you here? And isn't she Walter's wife? Why are you together? Miranda, you never knew where I worked while we were married. This woman is the daughter of my company's president. Miranda looked even more shocked. What a coincidence! Walter's wife is related to Daniel's company? Miranda had been indifferent to Daniel's job and spent her time neglecting their home and partying with men. So, it wasn't surprising she didn't know my family owned the company. But now wasn't the time for that. I called out towards the inside, where Walter was likely. Walter. Make sure to fill out that divorce application properly. If it's too much trouble, just give it to me, and I'll submit it for you. Hearing my voice, Walter appeared from the back, holding the divorce application. Is this what you're talking about? Yes. That's it. Seeing how eager I was to finalize the divorce, Daniel interrupted. Wait a minute. Your husband had an affair with Miranda. There's evidence. He needs to write a pledge to pay the compensation before you submit the divorce application. Compensation, huh? With my income, it shouldn't be too high. He said nonchalantly. But Daniel glared at him as if to say it wouldn't be that easy. It seemed he had something in mind. After dealing with Walter, Daniel turned to Miranda. And Miranda! You haven't paid the compensation for your affair. I even let you have the apartment. What's your excuse? I can't tolerate this anymore. 
Pay up now! Daniel's intimidating demeanor made Miranda cower. Seeing this, Walter tried to defend Miranda. Kelly's father was the same. This is pure intimidation. What's with your company? It's scary. Walter's face turned even paler. He looked at me nervously and said, Is your family? Yes. Just as you think. But now it's a legitimate business. My father is respected in the community and does his job diligently, which is why your parents didn't oppose our marriage. Miranda also seemed unaware, turning pale. She seemed to understand that if she didn't pay the compensation soon, she might be in trouble. Daniel, I'll work and pay it off little by little. Can you wait until then? I'm fine with that, but Miranda, you owe more than just me. You had an affair with Kelly's husband, so you must pay compensation to her too. Miranda, frightened by Daniel's intimidating voice, answered softly. Yes. All right, that's settled. Those who do wrong must be held accountable. That's right. And Walter, you need to write a pledge that you won't see our daughter after the divorce. Normally, Walter would argue back, but like Miranda earlier, he just nodded quietly and said, Yes. Neither Daniel nor I were using our positions to intimidate. We simply believed in holding people accountable. I took the signed pledge and divorce papers from Walter and left with Daniel. I've always relied on him for everything. So, I need to thank him properly. Daniel, thank you so much for today. Without you, Walter would have taken advantage of me. No, Kelly. Thanks to you, I can finally get compensation from Miranda. I'm completely over her now. Daniel and I felt relieved. Even though we had both cut ties with our problematic partners, we still felt unsettled without closure. But now, we can forget the past and look forward to living our lives positively. The next day, Walter returned to work after his two-week vacation, only to be met by the hospital director's furious face. Daniel's subordinates had sent photos and audio recordings of Walter and Miranda's trip to the hospital's website. He must have instructed them to do so. I appreciated him thorough actions. Seeing the evidence of Walter's lies, the director decided to fire him. It's no surprise, as Walter had taken leave for his wife's childbirth but went on a trip with his mistress instead. I learned this because Walter's parents came to apologize after our divorce was finalized. They told me everything about Walter's situation. Walter's parents paid the compensation he owed me in a lump sum. Of course, they said they would make him repay them later. His disgraceful behavior became well known in the medical community here. In a small rural area, word spreads quickly to neighboring towns. So, it's no wonder he couldn't find a new job. Walter ended up staying with Miranda, unable to secure employment. Meanwhile, Miranda had to work multiple part-time jobs from morning till late at night to pay the compensation to Daniel and me. With Walter staying there, he's probably being treated poorly. Eventually, Walter called me, seeking help. Kelly, I'm sorry. Please let me work at your company. I'll endure any tough conditions. Oh? You are so afraid of our company. Walter explained that Miranda, busy with part-time jobs, made him do everything. Even a little dust left from cleaning meant doing it over. If she didn't like the food, she would flip the table. I never imagined she could be so terrifying. Sure, she was strong as a kid, but sometimes she even chases me with a knife. I can't take it anymore. Well, she did protect you from bullies. Even I would be scared of such a strong woman. Indeed, no one in our company ever did anything as dangerous. I was surprised too. But though I felt sympathy, helping Walter would mean he might see our daughter. 
If possible, I didn't want him to see our daughter now. Someday, when she grows up and decides she wants to see her father, that's different. So, I decided to be cold. I'm sorry, Walter, but I can't help you. You need to take responsibility, find a job, earn enough to leave Miranda, and take care of yourself. I said this and hung up without waiting for a response. He has a medical license, so he'll manage somehow. But soon, something shocking happened. One day, while watching TV at home, I saw news that Walter and Miranda had been arrested. When I looked into it, I found out that Walter, desperate for money, found a high-paying job online. Miranda jumped at the opportunity and joined him. But it was a shady job. It was a job advertised on social media, a so-called courier job. They just had to deliver a mobile phone to a specified location, but the phone contained information for illegal transactions. Walter and Miranda claimed they didn't know, but that didn't absolve them of their crimes. Walter is clueless about anything outside of medical work. Maybe he got into this mess because I told him to find a job on his own. Of course, blaming me won't lessen his guilt. Walter needs to pay for his crimes. I returned to work at my family's company shortly after the divorce. Everyone was more shocked by her abusive behavior towards him than by the crime itself. Even we wouldn't go that far. Someone said. She really is a terrifying woman. No wonder Daniel left her so quickly. Another added. Daniel nodded in agreement, arms crossed. Truly bad people might not be from our world. Those who speak the loudest without knowing anything are often the scariest. She is a prime example. Hearing him laugh, everyone else in the office burst into laughter too. This company really feels like a family, always warm and friendly. Since returning to work, Daniel and I have been working hard to strengthen our company. Some colleagues suggest that I should get together with Daniel, but he's just a work partner. I'm enjoying my job too much to think about remarrying. My father named my daughter Alice. Though he remains the company's formal president, he has stepped back from frontline duties to focus on raising Alice. Our colleagues praise his dedication to childcare. And he looks pleased. Alice is especially attached to him, so with him around, I don't have to worry about childcare and can focus on work. That's why I throw myself into my work every morning. Look at that broke company trying to act big. $300 in the bank. What a big joke. I'm here to withdraw $15 million. When I said that at the major bank, they looked down on me like I was some poor, insignificant business. The banker who served me this time had harassed me in the past too. I couldn't take it anymore. I decided I would give her a taste of hell and make her regret ever crossing me. My name is Letty Blythe. I'm 45 years old this year. Many of my peers are struggling to balance work with caring for aging parents, or are dealing with the loss of a parent and the changes that brings to family dynamics. But I lost both my parents when I was just three years old, so my memories of them are hazy at best. I have photos, so I know what they looked like. From what I can tell, they seemed like kind, gentle people. About a year after I entered the orphanage, one of the staff members told me. Your parents were office workers and very hardworking. On their days off, they would take you to the zoo. But even hearing that, no memories of my parents came flooding back. Instead, most of my childhood memories are of the orphanage. After entering the orphanage, I was unbearably lonely being on my own. I loved animals. I want to have a puppy. So little me would pester the staff, saying. But pets were strictly prohibited at the orphanage. So one of the staff gave me a stuffed dog toy instead. It had been sitting in storage and no other kid wanted it, but I instantly adored it. I basically never let go of that toy, 
carrying it with me everywhere. That much I remember clearly. Once I started elementary school, I did eventually resign myself to just keeping it in my room. But it remained my most cherished possession. Then, when I was in fifth grade, I got the idea to try making my own stuffed animals. I grabbed my school sewing kit and set to work crafting a stuffed puppy. It wasn't the prettiest thing. You did such a great job on this. But one of the staff praised me, saying. Encouraged by that, I threw myself into making more stuffed animals. I got better and better each time. By high school, I was so obsessed that I joined the handicrafts club. In my senior year, I won an award at a crafting competition. That inspired me to seek out a job in the textile industry after graduation. I've had a variety of experiences since then to get to where I am now at my current company. Looking back, I'm amazed at how far I've come, to be honest. I hope to continue making a living in the future with the crafting skills that have sustained me through life. At least, that's how I feel. But lately, I've been tormented by this one particular person. Her name is Clarice. Clarice is a 50-year-old banker who lives in the luxury condo building right across from my place. I, on the other hand, am not living in any fancy home like that. My apartment is old, built over 30 years ago, and costs $500 a month in rent. This area used to just be open fields with a scattering of houses here and there. But about five years ago, housing complexes and high-end condos started popping up one after the other. My apartment building has been here since way before all that development. It still remains, surrounded by these newer high-rise buildings, without ever being renovated itself. Some might think that with such a nice luxury condo right there, I should just move into that instead. At first, I did briefly consider moving. But I ultimately decided against it. The rent is just too expensive, and I don't need all the fancy amenities that come with a luxury condo. Those condos apparently have tight security, observation decks with great night views, party rooms, and 24-hour concierge service. But I'm not interested in hosting parties or admiring vistas. Plus, my landlord upgraded to high security locks for each unit and installed security cameras out of crime concerns. My apartment doesn't have a grand entrance or anything, but for someone like me who doesn't keep expensive items at home, this is plenty. I can't justify paying over $2,000 a month in rent just to live in a luxury condo. Different lifestyles suit different people, after all. Clary seems to be someone who likes surrounding herself with upscale things. The rings and necklaces she wears are all from high-end brands. Whenever she runs into me taking out the trash, I just bought this new piece. I already got tired of the ring I got two months ago. She brags. At the same time, she looks down on me in my more modest attire. It's such a nuisance. Aren't you embarrassed to go around dressed like that? Should I give you some of my designer items? Actually, never mind. She made fun of me like this just last week. It was infuriating. On top of that, she knows my unit number. She probably saw me coming and going from my apartment by chance. Because of that. I had an exquisite French meal today. Ah, it was so delicious. She occasionally shows up at my door to boast. All I want is to relax at home, but having to listen to her insipid bragging ruins that. And she doesn't leave after five or ten minutes. She blabbers on for over twenty minutes. When I saw that ring, I couldn't help but exclaim this is my destiny ring. Not destiny partner, destiny ring. Life can be funny like that, you know. She gets all worked up like this, talking in an overly loud, emotional voice. It bothers the neighbors. The walls in my apartment are thin, so if you're even a little loud, everyone can hear it. 
Excuse me, there are other residents here too, so could you please keep your voice down a bit? Also, it's already 8 p.m. and I'd like to eat dinner. Even when I say this, she pays me no mind. I'm graciously sharing my superior knowledge with you, and this is how you act. Should I tell you about the necklace I'm wearing right now too? She says ridiculous things like this, completely unwilling to listen. The other day, my next-door neighbor Maurice got fed up. Hey! You're being too damn loud. Can't you see Letty doesn't want you here? And angrily came over. Seeing the intimidating Maurice, Clarice's face filled with fear. I am so sorry. She let out a shriek and then fled at full speed. I felt relieved. Heh, that was nothing. We neighbors gotta look out for each other. But what's the deal with you and her? Well, actually. I gave him a quick rundown about her. Ah, she's one of those luxury condo people. Bit of a local celebrity, huh? But why is she so fixated on you? It's not like neighbors get that close these days. So here's the thing. I could understand his confusion. It's extremely rare for someone to be this persistent in harassing a neighbor just for seeming poor. The reason things have escalated to this point is because I had a run-in with her in the past. It was about six months ago. I had business at a major bank branch, so I stopped by the teller window. The teller who assisted me that time was none other than her. She greeted me. Hello but I got the distinct feeling she was looking at me with a condescending gaze. However, I hesitated to point that out to a bank employee I was meeting for the first time. I figured I was probably imagining it, so I started to tell her what I needed. Um, I have a 1 p.m. meeting scheduled with the branch manager. I'm Letty Blythe. I was told to let the front desk know and I would be shown to the conference room. I didn't think I said anything strange, but Clarice suddenly blew up at me. Huh. Don't you lie to me. Ms. Blythe already arrived a long time ago. What? I was at a total loss, getting scolded like that out of nowhere. I mean, I wasn't lying at all. Flustered, I checked my schedule book, wondering if I had the date or time wrong. But no, I didn't. Could you please double check? I should have a meeting scheduled in the conference room at this time. I politely repeated my request, but she still refused to listen. I'm telling you. You're just a fake one, aren't you? Enough with the lies, tell me the truth already. No, I am the real one. I had important business to attend to, so I couldn't just say okay then and leave. I even showed my ID, but she claimed that was fake too and refused to believe me at all. As I wondered what to do, the branch manager, having heard the commotion, came running over. I am so sorry, Ms. Blythe. Right this way to the conference room. He escorted me, so it worked out somehow. Later, I heard from the branch manager that a completely different person also named Blythe had a meeting scheduled with him from 12 p.m. that day. Clarice had been aware of that other Blythe but had completely forgotten about my existence, apparently. After my discussion with the branch manager concluded, I sincerely apologize for the misunderstanding. She did apologize to me but with a sullen look on her face. It didn't seem like she was truly remorseful, so my frustration wasn't entirely resolved. However, it would be pointless to expect a heartfelt apology from someone who gets that angry at a stranger over a misunderstanding. I came to terms with that and let it go. But then, a week later, as I was taking out the morning trash, Clarice came dashing out of the luxury condo across the street, eyes sparkling. I remember my body going stiff with fear. Um, can I help you? I live in this condo building. So you live in that apartment over there, huh? Turns out we're neighbors. 
Hearing that, I felt like I might faint. Sensing she was up to something, Clarice then said the most outrageous thing. You made me into a laughingstock. How are you going to make it up to me? Huh? Because of me. The root cause was her misunderstanding in the first place, so her resentment was completely misdirected. The branch manager scolded me, and regular customers said I was scary. It's all your fault. She glared at me with a look of bitter resentment, like a demon. From then on, she apparently saw me as her sworn enemy. She harasses me every chance she gets. It's a huge nuisance. I considered moving, but she only stops by two to three times a month at most. Factoring in the cheap rent and all, moving just because of her felt like a waste. Clarice herself seems to be keeping things to a level where I won't report her to the bank or be driven to move. I finally found a good little prey. I'm going to have so much fun tormenting you. She said creepy things like that with a grin. Some people might think it's better to move in that case. However, I had heard certain rumors about her and the luxury condos. Even Maurice. She's a real piece of work, targeting you like that. But I reckon you only gotta put up with it a bit longer. Might as well wait and see how it plays out. After hearing the whole story from me, said, Still, trouble has a way of striking without mercy. I had another errand that took me to the major bank branch. As my bad luck would have it, Clarice was at the teller window. I instinctively wanted to leave, but it couldn't be helped. With an unpleasant smirk. Please have a seat and wait. We'll call you when your number is up. Clarice handed me a number ticket and said, the bank was extremely crowded, so I thought it would take quite a while. And sure enough, I was right. Incredibly, I ended up waiting a total of five hours. I tried to kill time by working on my tablet and, with permission, going out to do some shopping partway through. But it was simply far too long. Thank you for waiting for so long. She called for me with a smile and I realized she had deliberately made me wait until the very end. However, pursuing the matter would be pointless since she clearly wouldn't apologize. And it would be a hassle to make a big scene at the teller window. Swallowing my frustration, I said, I'd like to withdraw $15 million. It's quite a large sum, but I notified the bank I would be withdrawing it today. Please process the transaction. Even I realized the amount I stated was rather unrealistic, but Clarice gave me a condescending look. A broke little company like yours is gonna try that? You've only got $300 in your account. What a load of hot air. Huh? $300 in my account? That can't be right. What on earth is she talking about? Excuse me, but I think you must be mistaken again. I'm quite certain I'm scheduled to withdraw $15 million today. Please double check your records carefully. I implored her, but Clarice wouldn't listen. I'm not falling for some broke person's excuses. Go on, shoo! Get out of here! Wait a minute! Can I please speak to a different teller? Realizing she was a lost cause, I tried to seek help from someone else. But, we only have trainees working today, and the branch manager is out. For someone spouting nonsense about $15 million, I'm the only one who can deal with you. She insisted. Indeed, the other bank employees were all young and giving me troubled looks. Don't you dare get involved. She told them forcefully. This person is just trying to pin her own mistake on me. She's actually the CEO of some broke company with only $300 in its account. With their colleague Clarice asserting this so strongly, truly no one else stepped in to help. As I wondered what to do, she said, Go on, don't just stand there in silence. 
leave. I don't want to look at some poor, compulsive liar. She actually tried to force me out. The people around me were giving me cold stares too. I realized I wouldn't get any support if I stayed there any longer. I decided to leave for the time being, but I couldn't take it anymore. I could feel the intense anger heating up my entire body. And so, I vowed to give her the full wrath of hell. The next day, as I returned to my office from the conference room during my lunch break, I casually glanced at my smartphone. I had accidentally left it behind and wanted to check if I had gotten any calls. To my surprise, there were over 30 missed calls, all coming in after 11 am. It was the bank trying to reach me. Figuring it must be about yesterday's incident, I immediately called them back. Then, Ah! I am so, so sorry about yesterday. I heard the voice of Clarice now completely flustered and apologetic. I want to properly apologize to you in person, so please come to the bank. Understood. I'll head over right away. Luckily, I didn't have any afternoon appointments. I scarfed down my lunch and made a beeline for the bank. There I found a pale-faced Clarice and the branch manager. We are terribly sorry for yesterday. Please, write this way to the conference room. The branch manager showed me in, and we entered the conference room. As soon as I sat down, Clarice launched into a frantic apology. I am extremely sorry. To think I made the same misunderstanding again. I knew it. So who did you confuse me with this time? Hearing the details, it turns out the other Blythe she had mistaken me for before was involved again. Apparently that Blythe is the CEO of a company in such dire financial straits that it's on the verge of bankruptcy. That Mr. Blythe seemed so poor, with only about $300 in his account. I mixed him up with you. Are you truly remorseful? That's incredibly rude to the other Mr. Blythe too. When I said that coldly, Clarice and the branch manager apologized again. Letty Blythe is the president of a stuffed animal manufacturing company. I explained before that her business is doing well. The branch manager scolded her harshly. That's right. I currently run a stuffed toy maker. After graduating high school, I worked at a company that produced small trinkets and plushies to sell at gift shops. Eventually, wanting to make original products that would bring people joy, I established my own company. I chose to focus on stuffed animals because I've had an attachment to them since I was little. I hope that, like they did for me, stuffed toys can provide comfort to children who need it. By the way, the reason I needed to withdraw $15 million was due to various factors like transferring some funds to accounts at other banks and renovating our manufacturing plant. Even during the meeting that led to Clarice developing a grudge against me, I had discussed this matter. Since such a large sum of money was involved, I wanted to clearly explain the reasons for the withdrawal. Still, that was a terrible misunderstanding. How could you get it so wrong? Well, since you live in that dirty, I mean, old apartment building, I just assumed your business must not be doing well. Instead of simply apologizing, she said unnecessary things. My company isn't that large, and I try not to be too extravagant for the sake of the future. It's not good to look down on people based on where they live. When I said that in an irritated tone, the branch manager apologized again. I am truly sorry for Clarice's behavior. She will be fired, so. Yes. I hope you can forgive me in light of that. Clarice also apologized repeatedly with a desperate look on her face. Is it because of the mistakes this time and last time? Or was it discovered that you were harassing me near my home? Harassing? Why would she say such an unnecessary thing? It seemed they hadn't heard about that part, so I told them everything as payback. 
the branch manager. I don't even know how to apologize. Stop bothering Ms. Blythe immediately. Lectured her. Yes. I won't interact with her anymore, so please forgive me. Seeing Clarice drenched in nervous sweat and looking completely haggard, I felt a bit of catharsis. Incidentally, the reasons for her firing were habitual negligence of duties and bullying of colleagues. I later heard her warnings to the juniors not to get involved were simply because she wanted to be intimidating and throw her weight around. My incident was apparently the decisive factor in her termination. The bank is probably better off without someone like her. And so, she was officially fired sometime after that. One week later, at night. I got home late from work, arriving by taxi around midnight. Just then, I saw a woman with a suitcase and backpack emerge from the luxury condo across the street. Even from a distance, I could tell it was Clarice. But despite the late hour, she was wearing sunglasses. Because of that, she didn't seem to see in front of her very well. As she descended the stairs near the entrance, she took a hard tumble. The sight of her rolling down with her suitcase was quite comical. I couldn't help but laugh. The night was quiet, so even a small sound carried. Clarice seemed to notice me. She took off her sunglasses and marched over. Hey, what are you laughing at? Sorry, it was just funny seeing you fall like that. When I answered her honestly, Clarice's face turned red. Don't laugh at other people's misfortunes. Instead of hanging out so late at night, hurry up and go home. I can't help it, I was working. More importantly, Clarice, what are you doing with sunglasses and so much luggage this late? Where are you going? When I sharply questioned her. Oh, that's. I'm just going on a little trip. She made a strained excuse. You're clearly flustered. There's no public transportation running in the middle of the night like this. Rather than a trip, this has more of a midnight run vibe. It's not a midnight run. I'm just moving out. She hastily denied it, but it must have been close to 3 a.m. No one moves out at this hour. You must have some incriminating circumstances and don't want to be seen leaving. How can you read my mind like that? She was shocked, but I think anyone could figure out that much. Don't tell me, you got in a fight with your husband and he kicked you out? How do you know? This is getting creepy. Hit with the truth, Clarice plopped down right there. But this isn't such a big deal either. You'd argue with your husband sometimes, right? I saw you yelling near the entrance many times. Indeed, living across the way, I inevitably catch glimpses of the luxury condo residents from time to time. Clarice would occasionally go out with her husband. You are the one earning money, so it's no big deal. It's because you keep spending that we can't save no matter how high my income is. And they'd have shouting matches like, You talk so loudly. I can hear it even from inside my apartment sometimes. I've never spoken to your husband, but I know his name is Terence. As I calmly explained, she hung her head in embarrassment. Oh no. I can't believe you overheard such ugly scenes. That's why I figured you'd end up divorcing and moving out eventually. Plus, a lot of people move out of there within two to three years. They do! Could it be a haunted spot? Ah, uh, that must be it. I keep getting hit with misfortune because of evil spirits. She's letting her imagination run wild, but that's not it. The rent there is really high, right? A lot of people can't maintain that standard of living and move out. As you'd expect, this luxury condo is for the wealthy. Temporarily successful investors and CEOs live there, but it seems difficult for them to keep paying over $1,000 a month in rent. Many move out within two to three years. Is that so? 
Well, I do have the financial means. If I hadn't gotten divorced, I could have kept living there normally. Clarice still puts on airs, but I can't help looking at her skeptically. Really? You were in quite a financial bind, weren't you? On what basis are you saying that? It's not good to make wild speculations. She argues back desperately, beads of sweat on her forehead. I have my reasons. First of all, you're always wearing brand name items, so I assume you spend quite lavishly. It's far more than a bank teller's salary could afford, right? How do you know the prices of brand name goods? She looks at me with the shock of discovering a new species. How rude. I'll have you know, I do business with my fair share of wealthy people. These days, you can easily look up the prices of brand name items online. That's true. As Clarice looks uncomfortable, I continue. If you're spending that extravagantly, it's clear you don't have much money. I don't know what your husband does, but he must have a high salary. You took advantage of that to splurge as you pleased, so you got kicked out. That's what I think. Whoa! You see right through me! She looks completely spooked, but she basically revealed all this herself. After all, I've seen Clarice and Terence have flashy arguments in front of the entrance before. What do you mean, get out? I'm at my limit with a wife who spends so much money without thinking of the future. Who do you think is earning that cash? They had that sort of exchange, and I've overheard similar conversations from time to time. So it was easy to imagine she got kicked out over money. After I explained all this, she looked utterly devastated. I thought people didn't get to know their neighbors these days, but you noticed so much. I do live right across from you. Sometimes I can't help but notice things. When I put it bluntly, Clarice covered her face with her hands and froze. How mortifying. To think I was such an open book. I heard it even when I didn't want to. Of course I'd find out if you're yelling that loudly. I retorted mercilessly, causing her to look even more ashamed. She tried to hide behind her suitcase. I wanted to sneak away because I didn't want anyone to know I got kicked out for being a spendthrift. Having everything brought to light is the worst. Too bad the person you least wanted to find out did. When I stated it plainly, Clarice shrank back further, looking even more uncomfortable. You've got that right. You really never know what life will bring. Well, you don't need to get all philosophical about your whole life. More importantly, if you're moving, shouldn't you get going? Passersby have been glancing over here. And indeed, behind us, a man was looking our way with concern. In the middle of the night, two women were facing each other. One was trying to hide behind a suitcase. Of course that would make someone uneasy. It's all right. I called out to him, and he left. But he still had a suspicious look on his face. She watched the scene unfold with a despairing expression. Why are there people out so late at night? This area has turned into a proper residential neighborhood. Sometimes there are folks who work late and come home in the middle of the night. As I explained what should have been obvious, she exclaimed. I can't stay here any longer. And with that, she dashed off, disappearing into the darkness. She's a noisy one, but I'd be glad if she's finally gone for good. With that thought, I returned to my apartment. However, a month later, I spotted a figure pacing back and forth many times in front of the luxury condo. As soon as that figure saw me, they approached. Clarice, is that you? Indeed, it was none other than Clarice, who I thought had left for good. I had gone for a walk to enjoy the nice weather and was returning in high spirits, but now that was ruined. Actually, I did move out of this luxury condo, but I couldn't find a new job. So I thought I'd somehow get my husband to take care of me again and came here. 
In the end, you're still relying on your husband, huh? Well, good luck persuading him then. I let out an exasperated sigh and tried to leave, but Clarice stood in front of me. The truth is, my attempt at persuasion already failed. I was walking around wondering what to do when I ran into you. I see. There's nothing I can do for you, so please move aside. Not wanting to get dragged into her mess, I tried to dash past her to my apartment entrance. But she persistently blocked my path. Ah, uh, wait! I need a little help! Hearing those words, I couldn't believe my ears. Did you forget what happened between us? Take a good look at your own actions. I know it's an unreasonable request. I'm not asking because I think there's a high chance. I'm betting on a slim possibility here. Why do you think there's even a possibility? I have zero intention of helping you. I said coldly, trying to hurry into my unit. How cruel. But then she started to cry. It's humiliating for me too, you know. And yet, to say you don't want to help, you must have lost all sense of human compassion. Are you saying it's my fault? Do whatever you want. She talks as if acknowledging her own wrongs, but then says I've lost all sense of human compassion. It's clear she hasn't reflected at all. Dealing with someone like this is just a waste of time. Fed up, I pushed her aside and climbed the stairs. Wait! You're really abandoning me! She let out a loud cry and chased after me. But at that moment... Shut up! How many times do I have to tell you? Maurice came bursting out of his apartment. As if on cue, two other residents also emerged. I was taking a nap, and now I'm wide awake. You're that person who made a ruckus sometimes, right? Letty said you moved out, so why are you back? Bombarded with remarks like these, Clarice froze in shock. You don't have to say all that out of nowhere. No, that's not it. We've been bothered by your yelling for ages. We have a right to complain. Maurice angrily gave her a scary look, causing Clarice to cower. Ah, uh, I suppose so. Still, you neighbors sure are close. This apartment building is pretty old. Some people have lived here for over a decade. The residents have known each other a long time. It's a rare apartment complex these days with such a tight-knit community. As I explained in a cold, matter-of-fact tone, Maurice and the two other residents closed in on Clarice. Get out! They said in a voice that seemed to rumble from the depths of the earth. Even Clarice realized this was bad news. I'm so sorry. Her body trembling, she fled. Don't you ever come back. I yelled after her retreating back. Perhaps thanks to the power of this neighborhood watch, Clarice stopped showing her face around the apartment. I didn't know what happened to Clarice after that but I found out by chance when I went on a business trip. I entered a restaurant to have lunch, and there she was, working as an employee. Seeing me must have really thrown her off. Why are you here? Because she screamed. Of course, the mail manager scolded her. But she seemed to have completely lost her composure. She dropped a glass of water, knocked over a salad. Mistakes left and right. I'm terribly sorry. She apologized over and over. You're completely incompetent. You're fired. But the manager berated her. The light may never shine on Clarice's life again. I couldn't shake the feeling. As for me, I'm still running my company to this day, steadily growing the business. A stuffed animal we recently released is selling well. I'm grateful we've entered mass production. I'm getting messages of thanks from children across the country, which makes me glad I chose this line of work. My relationships with the apartment residents are still good too. 
We often remark how nice it is that things have become peaceful. I'm so happy to be able to spend ordinary days without incident. Clarice was a real nuisance, but she taught me just how precious a mundane everyday life is. In any case, I'm fortunate to have found the best possible home. I want to live with a sense of gratitude for that. With such thoughts in mind, I'm working hard again today.